if you like you can put uh, your talk okay thank you and can you see can you see that now yeah yeah great okay perfect i was trying something i was trying to share it on my ipad so i could use a stylus and stuff but i don't know that that will work so okay okay this looks good so okay so maybe you start now okay uh, so, so our next speaker is mark you just so using generative advisory networks to produce knots with specified invariants. So Mark, please go ahead. All right, well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak at this uh, this conference. Um, I'm, I'm uh, kind of an, the odd person out here as I, I have been in the past when attending things like this. I'm, I'm a low dimensional topologist, I'm not a physicist. Um, I spend most of my time thinking about uh, four dimensional manifolds and, and surfaces in four dimensional manifolds. Um, and, and related to that are sort of knots and uh, classical knots in, in three-dimensional space and some of the descriptions that we, we uh, the ways that we describe four-dimensional manifolds and three-dimensional manifolds involves knots. Um, and so uh, a, a number of years ago, I, I kind of became interested in this idea of using machine learning uh, to see if we could say anything about knot theory. Um, and, uh, and, um, over the years, you know, we've seen some progress in, in on sort of the knot theory side of things as people have sort of uh, become interested in, in in applying machine learning and and uh, and things like that to knot theory. Um, but but coming to a workshop like this is is certainly nice because um, I think on the physics side of things, things are much more developed and there's much uh, much more people are trying much much broader things than than have been tried in knot theory. So it's nice to come, even though I don't understand the physics of everything. It's nice to come and. And sort of be a fly on the wall and see some of the, the cool things that are being done uh, with machine learning in 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 physics and so um so uh as as far as my talk goes today um what everything i say or most of what i say will be joint work with uh amy eubanks and jared sloan they were they were uh former undergraduate students of mine um who worked on this uh they both since moved on to to other things uh, Amy is working in, in software development, and Jared is working uh, on a PhD at Rice University. And we've we've also been joined by uh, Dan Ventura, who is in the CS department here at BYU. So um, everything I say, uh, uh, this I also should give the caveat: this is a work in progress. Um, we're uh, uh, certainly more to do in this front, uh, but but think of this as kind of a proof of concept of, of some of these ideas, and and uh, but certainly a lot lot more things that we're we're interested in trying. So. I, I think that I'm sort of the first one who's spoken strictly on knot theory, so I'll, I'll define a few sort of key concepts. Um, for, for my purposes, a knot is, is the image of an embedding of S1 into S3, uh, and typically we'll consider knots up to smooth isotopy of S3. Um, so you can either think of deforming S3 itself and moving the knot around with it, or you can just think about the knot itself moving by an isotopy in S3. Um, we typically represent knots using uh, projections into some planar, either onto S2 the, or the two sphere or onto R2. Uh, we call these diagrams. And uh, if you consider the classification of knots up to isotopy, um, it's not hard to sort of convince yourself that there's going to be infinitely many different distinct isotopy classes of knots. Um, and so we have this infinite data set. Um, and if we sort of just to get an idea of the size and scope of this data set, um, if we were to restrict ourselves to only considering knots with 19 crossings or less, um, or rather 18 crossings or less, we, we have about 352 million knots. Um, and so, so very quickly, this data set becomes very large. Um, and even from sort of the even from sort of the the beginning of knot theory or the, the first people who thought about knot theory, um, knot theorists have sort of been interested in tabulating knots and sort of keeping track of, of a list of knots. And so um, I think Peter Tate was was sort of the first one to start tabulating knots. And I think uh, I believe he went up to, to sort of this table here sort of only shows seven crossing knots, but I think he went up higher to 10 or, or beyond then. Um, and I think his interest sort of stemmed from, or at least some of the early sort of people were were motivated by by ideas from physics, much like um, you know, there's this nice interplay between physics and knot theory. Um, at the time, I think that they they hypothesized that that different atoms 
corresponded to to different knots and the knots of course were were sort of i think that the the term they used was swirling vortices in the ether so um so they they were thinking of physics and knot theory a while back i've i've been told by the physicists that i work with that this this uh this swirling vortices in the ether has since been discredited um but but knot theory still shows up in in a lot of uh a lot of things, uh, quantum field theories, engaged theory, and stuff like that. I, I'm, which I'm the least qualified, probably in this Zoom meeting to even talk about. So I won't say anything more there. But um, suffice it to say, knot theory is sort of has has been motivated a lot by ideas in physics for for a long time. So, um, so uh, supervised learning is, has entered the game much much more recently. Um, so uh, there's there's sort of we we've we've recently sort of I'm gonna sort of just kind of highlight a few of the ideas that have come into to knot theory um, from from machine learning, and I think we've recently hit a benchmark here where um, or sorry not a benchmark we've recently hit a milestone where where uh, you know five or six years ago there might have been one or two papers but now we sort of have enough papers enough literature that we can't quite fit everything into a slide and that's that's sort of just a recent development so we're I, I consider that a success uh, or at least indication that that some of these ideas are catching on so um so in, in some earlier work from 2016 i i showed that it, we could predict things like the slice genus quasi positivity and some other invariants um these are these are in the case of the slice genus and quasi positivity these are very difficult invariants to, to compute um there there there's no algorithms for computing them and you, we have to rely on sort of getting lucky with algebraic invariants and things like that um so the fact oops the fact that a oops sorry the fact that a neural network could predict them to over 97 99 accuracy in some cases um was was i think a little bit surprising at least to me that that a neural network could do as well as it could um uh, other work by uh, by uh, uh, Vishnu Arjun um, and then Parikar showed that uh, um, that the hyperbolic volume could be could be uh, predicted from the Jones polynomial and and in fact evaluations of the Jones polynomial and then in later work with uh, Jessica Craven um, uh, Vishnu and Arjun showed that uh, uh, that that they could come up with a, an explicit phenomenological uh, formula which which allows you to predict the the hyperbolic volume from from the Jones polynomial and evaluations. So, um, so that that was uh, nice to see that that we could we could sort of extract from the machine learning some something that could be sort of done by hand and, and explain some 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 things like that. In uh, in more recent work, um, we've uh, along with them we we showed that things like the slice genus and Rasmussen S invariant could be also predicted from the Jones polynomial. And I think Arjun may be speaking a little bit more about that later. Um, there's been work done to classify knot diagrams based on the knot type, um, both from sort of a pure knot theory perspective as well as as well as a more applied perspective by looking at polymer chains. Um, and there's a recent paper that showed up just in in the Journal of Nature that many of you may be aware of, where um, uh, a group of researchers at DeepMind uh, and others uh, were able to detect a relationship between algebraic invariants of knots as well as hyperbolic invariants. And then uh, to not only detect it, did they detect this relation, but they were able to rigorously prove it. So um, that was sort of the the uh, as far as I'm aware, the first sort of provable uh, sort of relationship that was that came out of sort of an investigation using machine learning. Um, other sort of areas of machine learning have been used, uh, or other use, areas of, of data analysis have been used. So topological data analysis has been used by by uh, several groups to to understand sort of knots and and how the different invariants relate. Um, reinforcement learning has been used uh, by by people like uh, Sergey, Jim, uh, Fabian, and, and Piotr. Uh, they they showed that reinforcement could be used to to um, show that certain braids are trivial, represent the unknot. Um, and then uh, the, a problem I think which has been studied more recently by by others. Um, and then there's other work that you know you you can try things like uh, uh, showing that that you can construct certain slice surfaces using using reinforcement learning. So. Um, so, so suffice it to say that the, there is sort of a, a growing interest in using machine learning to knot theory. Um, there, there is some some things that you need to be kind of careful with when when trying to use any sort of data science or machine learning in knot theory, and that is that that um, oftentimes there's there's patterns in knot theory that that occur with sort of low crossing knots, and it's never quite clear whether those patterns generalize to high crossing knots. So probably the the most start, stri stri striking example that I can think of. Um, is is 
um, sort of this trichotomy between there's uh, essentially three types of knots. So work of work of Bill Thurston shows that that knots can all be classified into one of three types. Uh, the first are torus knots. These are knots which can be isotoped to the boundary of a torus. Um, there's satellite knots, which are knots uh, for which there's a there is a non-trivial, uh, incompressible, non-boundary parallel torus. That doesn't matter exactly what that all means. But and then there's a third type of knots called hyperbolic knots. And if you look at sort of just the uh, hyperbolic knots are knots for which the, the complement of the knot admits a constant uh, negative curvature metric. Um, and if you look at the, the three types of knots here, uh, just up to 19 crossings, you'll see that the hyperbolic knots dominate with over 352 million, whereas for torus knots, there's 14 and satellite knots, there's 380. Um, and so for many years, um, if, you, if you had asked a knot theorist 10 years ago, um, whether sort of whether hyperbolic knots dominate and whether the proportion of hyperbolic knots goes to one as the number of crossings goes to infinity, uh, almost any knot theorist would probably tell you that, that almost certainly, yes, hyperbolic knots are sort of by proportion the, the, the most prevalent type of knots. Um, but it wasn't until sort of 2016 that Malyutin proved that if this were the case, if hyperbolic knots were in fact the most prevalent, then it would convict, contradict uh, uh, an old conjecture in, in knot theory called the crossing conjecture, uh, which says that the, the crossing number or the minimal number of crossings needed to represent uh, the connect sum of two knots is, is equal to the minimal number of the sum of the minimal number of crossings needed to represent each of those two knots individually. Um, and this, this crossing conjecture is widely believed to be true. There's, there's um, uh, sort of a lot of results that sort of push us in that direction. It's not quite proven yet, but but now, based on this work of Malyutin, uh, I think many people would say that hyperbolic knots eventually will taper off, and and you'll see that satellite knots are in fact the most prominent. And so, um, this is sort of a recent development that sort of highlights the the danger in sort of basing too too much, uh, putting too much of our our under or placing too much faith on sort of patterns we observe in low crossing knots. Um, another sort of interesting thing that that was sort of observed in some of this other thing. This is this is from sort of a paper I wrote. Um, and I won't say too much about it other than, uh, so I won't, I won't really get into the slice genus, um, but what the slice genus is, is it's just uh, some invariant of a knot. Um, and when I, uh, in, in sort of this earlier work, I, I trained neural networks that could produce or that could predict sort of the slice genus to a reasonably high degree of accuracy. When I ran it through all of the knots for which we were, we didn't know the slice genus, um, there was one knot in particular for which sort of the, 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 the predictions were particularly bad. So, it, so the slice genus is an integer. Um, and at the time, it was unknown whether the slice genus of this knot here was zero or one. Um, and it turned out that on all the braid representatives of this knot that I tried to compute it on, it turned out that the, the slice genus predictions averaged out to 0 0.5. So all of the other knots gave us much more clear predictions, whereas this knot here, um, the, the predictions were very, very vague. Um, this, this knot turns out to be Conway's knot, which is a, a famous knot for, for several reasons. Um, and so sort of after further investigation, I, I produced a bunch of other knots, which, which were sort of known to have the same slice genus as Conway's knot. And the neural network basically didn't know what, you couldn't make heads nor tails of these other knots. And it wasn't until 2018 that Lisa Piccarillo proved that indeed the Conway knot, uh, the slice genus of the Conway knot is one. Um, and and her she sort of had to pull in new techniques or fundamentally new techniques to, to prove this. Um, and so on the one hand, it, it sort of shows a limitation of machine learning um, that that you know if if we don't have sort of the techniques at hand to, to sort of find the answer to these questions, then it's doubtful that perhaps the machine might learn. Um, you know, because it's only looking at things that we have been able to compute. On the other hand, um, the fact that it the fact that it it did sort of have so much trouble on this knot indicates that there's something special about this knot. Um, and you can sort of try and ask questions as to whether this knot is related by concordance to any of the other low crossing knots or things like that. Um, these are very tough questions to, to answer. However, it seems like the neural network picked up on the difficulty of these questions even before we sort of knew maybe whether to ask them or not. So on the one hand, I think it shows a, perhaps a limitation of what machine learning is able to do when, when we're sort of applying it to, to problems that we've tried to answer ourselves. On the other hand, I think it, it also can, can sort of, it does sort of hint at things that, that maybe were, uh, it does sort of hint at things that, that um, you know, it, it can be useful for sort of identifying hard problems and, and maybe giving us an indication of where those answers might lie. So um, 
uh, Michael gave a great talk on Monday about sort of uh, what is string data and and so some of the questions he he asked sort of involved uh, you know sampling data and things like that and sort of how we build our data sets um, and so. Um, uh, when when trying to study knot data it's important to sort of have a good model of random knots so um, there, there are several models of random knots you can you can uh, sort of do 3d three dimensional models where you, you have self avoiding random walks you can do random braids or random diagrammatic models. Um, the one i'm going to focus on today is the petaluma model um, this model is is a fairly a new model 2012 uh, it was developed by adams and and collaborators. And essentially the idea is that every knot can be put into a position where instead of having crossings with only two strands, we have crossings with, um, with all of the strands are sort of passing above a single point. Now, because of this, we have to then label sort of the, the, the relative heights of these, of these strands. Um, and so when going around sort of this diagram, we have to label each strand with sort of the, the height at which it passes through that central point. If you sort of turn this picture on its side, you see what's called a stem diagram, and this might give you sort of an idea of what, what's sort of happening if we, if we turn this petal picture on its side. So uh, Adams proved that every knot can be, Adams et al. proved that every knot can be, established, can be put into this form. And so this gives us a way to generate random knots uh, by what's called the Petaluma model. Um, and essentially what we do is we, we can pick a random vector in, in Euclidean space, so R2n plus one. If we take this random vector and we interpret the entries as, as, being, as giving us an order type, we can think of that order type as specifying the heights at which these strands pass through the origin. And so therefore every knot in every vector in R2n plus one corresponds to a well-defined knot in the three sphere. Now, this is a nice feature to have. Um, for example, if you're working with random braids, you have to work a little bit harder um, to ensure that sort of the, 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 the word that you're writing down when you write down a braid word um, is actually a knot and not a link. Um, likewise, if you're doing things like random Gauss codes or random DT codes, um, there's, there's a lot of conditions that need to sort of be, be put in place in order to guarantee that the thing that you get is actually, is actually a knot and not a link. Uh, and in fact, something that's planar. Um, so, uh, even Zohar, Haas, Lineal, and Noick prove that, that, uh, um, that pedal diagrams, uh, sort of represent knots at about the same rate, or at least within, within a constant factor as, as regular diagrams do. And they showed that as the number of pedals increases, um, the, the probability of getting any, uh, any one knot goes to zero. Um, I studied this problem with some some collaborators. We show that they're sort of give if you have two two vectors that correspond to the same knot, um, they can uh, they can be related by a sequence of of pedal additions and deletions and what are called crossing exchanges. So you can think of this as sort of just a Reitermeister theorem. Um, Reitermeister theorem allows us to relate the diagrams of any two isotopic knots. Um, this theorem here we proved shows gives sort of the same sort of thing where you get a, a set of moves that allows you to relate. Um, relate the 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 uh, relate the pedal permutations of any two knots. Um, this is nice because uh, in addition to sort of the the uh, the upper bounds that that were given by previous work, this allows us to get some lower bounds on the number of knots which represent a given knot type. So for for example, if you're looking at sort of the the knot types of length two n plus one or pedal number two n minus one knots, sorry. Um, you can sort of get a lower bound on, on the number of those knot representatives that, that represent the unknot. Um, and so the uh, pedal, pedal permutations are particularly nice also because they sort of, the, the geometry of the space is, is fairly easy to understand. Um, and so, uh, and there's a, some other favorable features. So, so as far as sort of sampling random knots, um, pedal permutations, the petaluma model gives us sort of a, one that we sort of have a good, a good grasp on and, and we can sort of understand the geometry of the space and understand sort of the distribution of knots a little bit better than we would be able to in some, in some other models like random braid models and things like that. So um, I won't say too much about the Jones polynomial. So um, I, I, the, the main invariant that I'll talk about today is the Jones polynomial. Um, there is a diagrammatic way to define the Jones polynomial. Um, many of you would probably uh, think of the Jones polynomial as being uh, as, as coming from Chern Simons theory um, and, and being, you know, the expectation or of, of a Wilson loop operator or coming from there, at least the evaluations. Um, but, but there is a way to diagrammatically define it, of course. Um, the Jones unknot conjecture states that the only knot whose, whose uh, Jones polynomial is equal to one is the unknot. Um, this is probably one of the biggest open conjectures in knot theory. 
And um, it's been verified up to 24 crossing knots. So um, we know that there are no counterexamples of 24 crossings or below, uh, but there still could be a counterexample, a knot who is knotted, uh, not isotopic to the unknot, but whose who's, uh, Jones polynomial is, is trivial. Um, and so uh, one of the motivations for our study of generative, using generative machine learning in, in knot theory was, was sort of trying to come up with, uh, seeing if there's ways that we could generate examples of interesting knots, knots for which we sort of had some control over perhaps the invariance of these knots. Um, and so, so this is sort of the pie in the sky motivation. Uh, obviously, I think you know this is this is maybe a stretch to hope that we get there, but um, but but sort of being able to to produce knots with given invariance would be would be sort of a very valuable thing in knot theory as a way to study to study open conjectures. Um, one other thing I want to say is just that the the difference in the max degree and the minimal degree of of um, of the Jones polynomial it gives us a bound on the crossing number of a knot. And that, that'll come into play a little bit later here. So, so what's, the, what's the machine learning setup? Well, um, we, we wanna use generative machine learning in order to, to, uh, to produce knots with specified invariants. Um, so these pictures here, I just included these. These are obviously people that don't exist. These are artificial images generated by, by generative adversarial networks. And so we're gonna use similar ideas to generate knots. Um, so here's, here's the idea, a generative adversarial network, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, consists of two neural networks, uh, one of which is a generator whose job is to randomly produce images, artificial data. The discriminator's job is a discriminator is a second neural network and its job is to, um, is to learn whether, to distinguish whether uh, a given image comes from the generator and is an artificial image or whether it comes from some predefined uh, data set of real images. Um, so you have five more minutes. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, so the idea is, is that the, the, this is sort of the uh, schematic of the, this is a schematic of the, the architecture. Um, so we, we feed real images in, and we also have a generator, which takes some random input and creates false images. The discriminator looks at, at both the real images and the generated images and must learn to decide whether, whether the, um, which ones are real, which ones are fake. The discriminator's loss function is based on how well it classifies uh, real and false images, whereas the generator's loss function is based on how often it's able to, to trick the discriminator. Um, so we use a modified version of this, uh, which, which um, I'll, I'll cite sort of the source on this in a minute, um, where the way we modify it is, is uh, instead of just plugging in a real knot and looking at real knots, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pair them with real invariants. So we're gonna take a real knot, we're gonna compute its actual invariance values, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take that to be one of the, the real data set. The, the, generator, uh, the generator takes as input uh, random invariance as well as real invariance. So we take, we take random invariance uh, and real invariance. So when I say real invariance, I mean invariance that come from some real knot that we've computed. We take those invariant values like the Jones polynomial, we pass it to the generator, and then the generator uh, produces a knot, which which it it hopes will look like, which it hopes will have the same invariant values as as the ones we pass to it. So so we're passing so the instead of just passing images to the to the discriminator, we're passing a, a knot along with the invariants that we want to sort of match the knot, and the generator is going to then sort of have to produce a knot whose invariants match the given knot. The discriminator then has to look at these not comma invariant pairs, and it has to learn to decipher whether the invariants match the not, whether it's a real data point or whether it comes from the, the generated data set. Um, and again, sort of the, the, uh, the, the generator is now trying to trick the, the discriminator. So given, given some in input invariants, it has to learn to try and trick the discriminator and the discriminator is learning again, whether to, to decipher whether a not plus the invariance that's been given correspond to, to the correct, uh, correspond to a real pair. So this is based on a paper called Generative Adversarial Text to Image Synthesis, where they take text descriptions of, of birds, and then they train a neural network to produce images that match those text descriptions, and they get, they get uh, pretty good results, uh, uh, very convincing results. I mean, the images aren't, aren't crystal clear, but, uh, but, but you can certainly see that the images do match the descriptions as, as stated there. So our setup, um, we 
computed a number of invariants. Um, our data set, we produced a large data set, about four and a half million knots, and we represented them all by pedal permutations. We computed invariants using uh, Barnaton's knot theory package. Um, and then we trained, we implemented the GAN using Python and Torch and trained it on BYU supercomputing lab. Um, our test set was, was uh, about 10,000 knots. Um, the, the size of the test set varies at each run. And that is because um, when the neural network produces a knot for which it thinks matches the invariance, um, the, the size of the knot may, like the, the pedal permutation has a bounded size, but the corresponding crossing number of the knot might be very large. And for, for knots with really large crossing number, it's hard to compute things like the Jones plenum. It's time, time intensive. So we sort of had to fix some cutoff value of knots and then, and then only, only sort of verify that we were getting the correct answers on smaller ones just for, for sort of computational reasons. Um, so the, the absolute accuracy we were getting was not super high. It was actually pretty low. Um, we did get about twice as good as you would expect from sort of just randomly guessing. Um, but if we sort of expand our, if we expand our, our sort of criteria for checking accuracy and we sort of uh, check for near misses, say within plus or minus three, plus or minus two, whatever, um, we end up getting much better results, much closer results. So what this seemed to indicate to us is that the neural network, so, so remember that the, the span of the, the Jones polynomial, so I, I should have maybe emphasized that these, the results I have up here are just on the span of the Jones polynomial. Remember, the span of the Jones polynomial is a bound on the crossing number, a lower bound on the crossing number. And so the, the way that we're interpreting sort of this is that the, the neural network is learning in some sense to approximate the, the, the span of the Jones polynomial by, by perhaps just coming up with higher crossing number knots. And so it's not clear whether it's actually learning directly about the span of the Jones polynomial or whether it's learning just how to create sort of knots that have sufficient complexity to sort of trick the discriminator. Um, I think we have to do a lot more sort of sort of work to sort of tease that out. Um, here are some graphs. I think I'm I think I'm out of time, so I'll I'll kind of skip through these um, and just just jump right to the references. So, um, anyways, thank you thank you for your attention. Sorry for going over here a minute or two. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for the talk. So, is there any questions, please? I think Fabian wants to ask a question. Hi, Fabian. Hi, uh, it's Jim, actually. Uh, and um, Fabian also has a question. But I was wondering, Mark, really beautiful talk. I uh, don't know much about these Petaluma diagrams, but I know from my own experience that random knot ensembles generally don't produce prime knots, as you noted. Do you, could you give some intuition for what about this Petaluma model tends to generate prime knots? I, I don't have. So I, I, think I, I think I include, yeah, I may have included that somewhere on here. Um, but yeah, they, they do, they do, um, we don't, I don't think we have a good, we, we can't prove that they produce prime knots in general. Um, the comment that I included on this slide is, is based on sort of just tabulating small knots and things like that. And, and sort of, um, this was done by Adams and, and uh, another author I'm, I'm blanking on right now. Um, I, I don't have a good idea as to why, why sort of, um, uh, connected sums don't show up sort of early on. One, yeah. one, one guess might be that sort of the, the algorithm for putting the algorithm for putting um, putting knots in pedal form um, requires you to sort of line up the crossings in such a way that if you if you sort of yeah I maybe I maybe I shouldn't speculate too much on there I haven't thought too carefully about it but I should say so. But you think there might be some intuition in the data structure itself for why prime knots are produced with high probability? I mean, it, it seems to be a fact that low crossing number. Is yeah, yeah, th there may be a good explanation. I, I haven't thought a whole ton about that aspect of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Very Hi, much. Fabian. Um, I also have a question on, on this particular aspect and on a, a different thing. So the first question is, in these uh, set setups, did you check the prior from which the knots are generated? So for example, do you reproduce the ratio of uh, hyperbolic knots to torus knots uh, or is it um, is biasing towards a specific type of knot, like hyperbolic knot? Um, yeah. So we we haven't we haven't sort of gone through and checked in our data set what the that, that's a really good question. I mean, I think I think um, we we have run. So what I, what I can say is we have run other um, we've we've run like knots generated by other models because um, it's 
essentially when we generate the knots via the Petaluma model, we, we, um, we pass everything through uh, planar diagrams. And so you can, you can produce planar diagrams via other, re, other sort of sampling methods. And so we have, we have sort of compared to other sampling methods and, and sort of, cause that, that was a question I had is sort of, you know, are, are pedal knots sort of biased in any way? And, and um, at least sort of by, by doing a few other random sampling methods, it, it, the results we were getting were similar. Um, but I think a more careful analysis is something we, we definitely want to do with this, these pedal sampling techniques. Cool, thank you very much. And my second question, when you set up your GAN, um, so naively what I would have set up is, can, can you go to the slide? What oh, you just, yeah. the, the, um, the architecture? Yeah, um, exactly this one. So naively what I would have set up is I would have set it up such that it gets real and random invariance and it generates knots from these, but you also add more random input in here. Do you need this to combat mode collapse or what's the principle or reason why you don't generate just the jet knots from the random invariance, but you also put more random noise in there? Um, yeah, so 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 mode collapse is a concern. Um, I, our, our data set is fairly large, so I, I think I think that also helps sort of combat mode collapse. Um, I the, one of the, one of the sort of the, the the end goal would be to sort of be able to to draw a sample of of knots from you know with a with a set of dist with a um, given sort of invariant set and so having sort of that random input allows us to sort of uh, get a variety of knots that we can sample from there as opposed to sort of just getting a single you know a single input invariant leads to a single output knot we'd like to sort of be able to to sample a, a given set of knots so um, so that, that is also sort of one of the goals at the end is to, to be able to sample knots with a sort of pre-specified set of invariants. And so having that random input allows us to sort of to, to get some variability in the output. I see. So because you're saying the random invariants don't uniquely specify the knot. Pardon me? Because you're saying the random invariants you're putting in do not uniquely specify the knot. You want to be able to generate many knots with the same. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, if there is no more question, then let us all thank Mark for the wonderful talk. And